what a pleasure it is to be able to do this together. Uh, in the Middle Eastern culture, which uh, is specifically, or rather I should say, more specifically the Jewish culture, there is a ceremony uh, which is called, and forgive me for my pronunciation, it's a Hebrew word, uh, it's a technical term used in the Talmud, according to uh, the research done. The Talmud is the, the uh, book of Jewish law. And uh, the ceremony is called Keza ceremony. It's actually uh, spelled K-E-Z-A-Z-A-H. So there is a double Z there. Uh, and there are various ways of pronouncing it, but I'm presuming that uh, let's, for convenience sake, pronounce it Keza ceremony, all right? The, um, the meaning of the word kiza is literally cutting off or severing of connections, uh, severing of connections, cutting off from family and society. Why is this ceremony performed? Uh, according to the records that we have, when a especially from a Jewish community, when a Jewish man leaves the community to specifically defy the community in terms of marrying someone who is an outsider, outside of the community, or he is going to leave his family uh, to take away his wealth and squander it. Uh, this ceremony is done if he ever comes back. Because obviously, you know, when someone marries outside of the community or uh, does something that, you know, is as serious as squandering the wealth, it is not, it is looked down upon. It's actually bringing shame to the family and to the community and to the faith. And so, if this man ever comes back, the elders of the community would stop him from entering the city or the village. They would stop him and they would bring a clay pot and some records say that they fill it with burnt beans or some other records say they fill it with something else, right? And they will break the pot in front of him. Uh, what does that symbolize? It's symbolic of that a relationship has been broken. Uh, because this person who has done this misdeed of marrying outside or, or uh, frittering away his wealth has, is considered a sinner to be separated from the family, from the community and the faith. It's a visual symbol of to confirm the separation. And what is the reason for that? Why do they do such a ceremony? It is because this person has brought shame to the family. This person has humiliated the community. And so this person has to be uh, shunned or disfellowshipped or whatever, you know, equivalent words we can use. And so since this person has brought humiliation, they, they do the ceremony, the kiza ceremony, where a pot is broken to signify a broken relationship. And when this is done, the father of the boy, of this person, was uh, under strict instructions not to go and meet this person because the father must acknowledge the severance of that relationship, the, the breaking away of that relationship. Why again? All because the son has brought shame to the family. Let's travel from the Middle East and let's come to the subcontinent and specifically our own country, right? In one sense, in our culture, 
you could say Eastern culture or even, you know, in the Indian culture. We have an equivalent Kiza ceremony, almost, but much, much more gruesome. And I was reading a story that took place in the state of Tamil Nadu. The story of a 25-year-old boy whose name was Nandish, who belonged to the Dalit community, married a lady. Her name was Swati, uh, who was from a different caste. When the father came to knowledge of what had taken place, that his daughter married somebody from a different community, he was shamed beyond, you know, something that he could ac ac accept. He decided to take, you know, this particular shame into his own hands to do something about it. He engineered the murder of both Nandish and Swati, made sure the bodies were thrown into a river. Unfortunately, he was found, or fortunately he was found, uh, confessed to the crime, and obviously he was arrested. What was the reason that this father would do it? Because according to some sayings of our community, of our Eastern culture, girls are the bearers of family honor. And so if a daughter of a family brought shame to the family and the community, she needed to be punished. Because in our cultures, shame is something which is looked down upon, you know, with tremendous amount of vehemence. So in many cultures around the world, and like I said, especially Eastern, we seem to honor pride uh, very much. We want to be, we want to be considered a community which upholds a certain sense of pride and honor. And any blot that is, you know, brought on the honor or the pride of a community is a serious offense. And that's the reason why sociologists say that the Eastern culture, which of course encapsulate the subcontinent, is a shame-based culture. We are a culture that where we do not want to lose face. You probably have heard of that phrase, losing face. We don't want to lose face in, you know, in front of other people. It is looked at, like I said, very seriously. So they will do everything to preserve the honor of the family or the community or the faith, like it was in the Jewish uh, situation. And some people resort to extreme practices, like I just mentioned that story about the, the boy and the girl who got married. And some resort to these ceremonies, that, like the Kiza ceremony, to remove the shame from the family that they would do such a thing. It is in this backdrop that I want to bring something from the parable of the prodigal son. Now, all of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with that. It is probably one of the more, uh, what you would say, uh, favorite uh, or most read parable parable of the prodigal son, as it is titled. And I'm sure you are very familiar with it, so I will not go to read the whole parable, but I want to re revisit a portion of it. And mind you, as I do that, keep in mind the Kiza ceremony and the Eastern culture, which is shame-based. Of course, the story is found in the book of Luke chapter 15, uh, the story says there are two sons. Uh, the father has two sons. One son asks for his inheritance before, you know, the father could pass away and he takes his inheritance, goes and squanders it. What does he bring on, upon the family when he does that? 
shame. He brings shame upon the family. The other son thinks that he is very good, very righteous. He's done everything right. But he can't rejoice when the, that younger brother comes back and refuses even when the father goes to him and says, come, let's rejoice. And he refuses to listen to his father, thus bringing shame upon the father because he did not preserve the dignity of the father by listening to him and obeying him, but stayed away from the banquet. I want to now slowly focus on this father, right? How he reacted when that younger son came back and how he reacted to the uh, elder son. But more so, uh, nothing much is said about the elder son, but a little bit more is said about the younger son. And I want to pick up the story in Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning to read just one verse, verse 20, once again, keeping the stories that I just mentioned at the background. It says in verse 20, you remember how this son decides to come back. And he, the son, arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. All right? Just want to pick up some very powerful thoughts that this verse brings. Notice it says, when the son was a great way off, the father seemed to be looking out, looking out to see if this long lost son would somehow, some way return to come back. But the question we have to ask is, why is the father looking out? Why is the father wanting to spot him far away? Perhaps even before he enters the village. Because he knew of the Kizar ceremony. The father knew that the elders of the town or this village would, the moment the son is spotted, would initiate the Kizar ceremony and bring the pot to break in front of him, thus cutting him off forever, not even allowing him to enter the village. But this father did not want that to happen. This father wanted something else. And so this father spots him while he was far away. What happens next? He had compassion on him. That's what the scripture says. What is this compassion that the father's heart seemed to be beating with? You see, he not only wanted the son not to be cut off to prevent the kiza ceremony being performed, but his heart was obviously filled with so much love that in spite of what the son did, the father, uh, you could say, just couldn't stop loving him. Because his heart was filled with nothing else but love. He couldn't stop loving this son, even though he had sh brought shame upon him and the family. And so, the father had compassion, uh, you know, longing for the son to return. And then what happens? It says he had compassion. He arose uh, when he had still a great way off. The father saw him, had compassion, and ran. <laughs> Why would the father run? And it says not only did he run, but he fell on his neck and kissed him. Uh, once again, going back to the Middle Eastern situation, the culture there. Uh, 
for an older man, a patriarch, someone who is respected in the community to run, is not a very dignified thing to do. Right? Uh, nobody would consider an elderly person who is respected to be running. You know who ran? Only servants ran. They ran to do the job of what the patriarch said. So running was not necessarily very uh, a dignified thing to do. And on top of it, if a man like this father had to run, you know what he had to do? And I'm sure you, have, you, you, you can remember this, uh, you know, probably said many a times. He had to lift his garment. It's like all of you who wear lungis. If you were a lungi and it is touching your ankles, if you have to run, what should you do? You have to lift your lungi. No, I don't wear lungis. Uh, some of you do, I know. Uh, uh, and uh, if you don't lift your lungi and run, you know what's going to happen. But when you lift your lungis, what are you exposing? You're exposing your legs, right? That is shameful in that culture. And probably here too, I don't think an elderly person would lift his lungis or, I, I'm not sure, maybe he, it's okay here, but there it was humiliating. It was undignified for a person like that to do that. Contemptible. May I use the word shameful? Shameful for a man to do that, who at, at his stature, you know, belonging to that stature. What did this father do? He runs. Only servants run. What does this father do? He lifts his garment, exposes his legs, humiliating himself, bringing shame upon himself. What was the father doing? What was this father doing? Doesn't he know better? Can't he preserve the dignity of his age and his stature? He was becoming a servant when he ran. And when he lifted up his garment to run, he was taking the shame upon himself. So think for a moment. Think for a moment. He did what a servant would do in that culture. He did what an elderly man would never do, taking shame upon himself. So, <clears throat> who became a servant? for humanity. Who took shame upon himself, you know, to remove the shame from his child? The Jewish scriptures prophesy of a person who would come to do this. You have all read uh, Isaiah 53. It's a, a you know, a messianic uh, what do you say, chapter. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read a few thoughts from the first portion. Uh, it may not necessarily be in order. But Isaiah 53 prophesies of a servant who would come, who, was, who would be willing to take the shame upon himself. It says, he is despised uh, uh, and rejected by men. Notice that? He is despised because he took shame upon himself and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, humanity, hid, as it were, our faces from him. When a person is shamed, we turn away our face. You know, because he needs to be shamed, you have to break that pot and say, get out, you're, a, you're worse than a leper. And it goes on to say in Isaiah 53, he was despised and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he has borne our griefs, this prophecy says, and carried our sorrows. But, and it's a big but, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our shame. Rather than shaming us, he takes the shame upon himself. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who is that person? I think for us the answer is very obvious. Who is this person? Who is this person that we have despised? That mankind has rejected? And turned our faces from him. Who is this man who has borne our shame, our guilt, who became our servant? Who would be even willing to wash our feet? Who is this one who would take the shame of a common criminal and to be crucified outside the city walls? Remember, crucifixions took place outside the city. They would not want this common criminal even to be crucified in the city. Too shameful. Too shameful. Who is the one who took upon himself the shame of being crucified outside the city, hung on a cross, stripped of all his clothing to be exposed in stark nakedness. And that's what is actually the truth. He had no loincloth. Shamed outside the city. Well, you know the answer, right? Uh, uh, and why, why would he do that? Why would this person come and do this? Because going back to the parable of his great compassion, uh, great compassion on his children, he was willing to take the shame, our shame, upon himself. That is why in the reading that was read to us, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, became a servant to die on the cross, despising the shame, despising the shame. He, Jesus Christ, was that servant. Though he was a king, he became a servant who endured the cross for our sake. And you could say who's constantly running toward us. He's constantly reaching out to us. Why would he reach out? Because he's quick to forgive. Just like that father was wanting that son to come back. He was wanting us to be back in his house. The father was wanting that person to be back in his house. And when the father ran towards the son, he fell on his neck and kissed him, right? Just to let him know, don't worry about what happened. Your sins are forgiven, right? And notice it says in the reading, despising the shame, looking unto Jesus who despised the shame. In other words, he took the shame upon us to free us from our shame. And by doing that, he put shame to death. He put shame to death. And so the reading says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Here we are told, or we are encouraged to not grow weary, not to lose heart, not to lose the faith. And so, brethren, today, 
we come together once again after a long time to take the communion together. What a privilege it is for us to take this communion. And as you do this, as you come forward to the table, those of you who would like to take the communion, perhaps you could recollect that the Father has already invited you. He is waiting for that son to return. But do you feel ashamed? Are you coming with a sense of shame? Perhaps by your own weaknesses? Maybe the shortcomings that continue to dog you? False, sinful behaviors, sinful thoughts, sinful thinking, sinful attitudes? Are you ashamed of that? Well, let's be ashamed of that. But let's not forget that shame has been taken from you. You don't have to feel ashamed anymore. Have you come with a sense of shame, maybe shamed by others, despised by others, wrongly accused by others, uh, found fault by others? You know, it's all a, you know, all a, a sense where we feel weighed down by the sense of shame. That's when we are told and we are encouraged to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that what a picture we are being given? Sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where Jesus is today. He's taken the shame, despised it, and he is now sitting at the right hand of God. Now we could think of it as a position of power, yes, but it's a position of favor. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in his, incar in his resurrected, glorified state, holding humanity in his heart and telling the Father, let's welcome them home. You know, uh, Let's welcome them home. He and his father are sitting and waiting for that time when the fullness of the kingdom is here. And he will probably fall on our necks and kiss us. Thankfully, with Jesus, there does not have to be a kiza ceremony. We don't have to worry that a pot will break in front of us or on our heads. We don't have to worry of an irate father who would come with a knife to slice you up because you brought shame upon the family. Instead of that, you would probably get a kiss and an embrace. And so, brethren, as we come to the table, as we participate in the communion, may this communion be meaningful for us. Let it not just be another ceremony. Because this is an invitation to you and to me as children of God. We are being invited again and again and again. That is why it says, the apostle says, as often as you take this cup and this wine, you're coming into his presence. You are saying, I accept your invitation, Lord. You are saying, I want to come home. I want to come home. And if you want to come home, you will be welcomed. Jesus Christ welcomes you. But we have to turn and come. You will not be shamed. With human beings, we are shamed. Again and again and again, we will be shamed. You will be shamed by others. You will be shamed by your own situations. But with Jesus, you will be welcomed. There will be no more shame. Why? Because he, Jesus Christ our Lord, bore our shame.
Let's pray. Loving, gracious Father, here we are, Father. What a privilege it is for us to come together uh, collectively in person to once again partake of the communion. We have done it so, so very much on screen, but it's just not the same, Lord, when we can actually uh, be in the presence of one another physically and we know we are in your presence. Thank you so much for this opportunity. But as we come to this table, may we all be reminded, Lord, we are being invited, invited to come home, the only home that we, where we will be free of shame, free of the burdens of life. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you had so much love in you, which was a reflection of the love of the Father's heart. And in the Holy Spirit, and in your incarnation, you came to shed your blood on the cross and allow your body to be broken. And so we symbolize it by this wine and this bread, which Jesus Christ himself said we must do. We do it in that wonderful hope that our shame has been removed. And if any one of us continue to be shameful, let it, yes, let us feel the shame, but let it change us, Father. And let us come to give that shame to you because you so willingly have taken our shame. Thank you for bearing our shame. And so bless this bread as a symbol of your broken body and this wine as a symbol of the blood shed for us on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, as you even were taken out of the city walls to be crucified, and yet you have invited us into the city, into the great, wonderful city of the Lord. Thank you so much for that. And so bless this, Father, as we partake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please come forward. Feel free to take the wine and the bread. Maybe you can take it back to your seat and we will partake of it together. Short of one glass, I think we'll, we will make sure you get that glass. Please take the bread if you like. Or you can, share the, you can share the cup, like Jesus told the disciples to share the cup. <laughs> All right. Uh, we had one cup short, but uh, yes, there is enough wine for us to take it together. We'll just wait for uh, Joshila and Selena to get back. And as we... Take a moment to remember 
the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, reflecting his Father's love for us in the Holy Spirit. This is the body of Jesus Christ symbolized in this bread. Take it for our uh, the absolving of all our sins. This is the wine symboli symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ. And through his shed blood, he has taken our shame and given, given us the invitation to come into his home, the blood of Jesus Christ.